<clears throat> okay. We're going to go ahead and get started now <clears throat> on this talk. Um, by God's grace, um, it will be my, my, uh, my aim, my desire this evening just to uh, slow it down a little bit from uh, uh, preaching to teaching. <clears throat> Does that sound all right? Um, I know that, um, especially myself, I know that I have a, a habit of getting excited and um, and that's just what happens when I study the Word of God. It's just such a blessing. Uh, but I do recognize the need to uh, sometimes be able to slow down a little bit and make things a little bit more clear. Um, so what I'd like to do this evening is just try to uh, take it a few notches down and just um, have an opportunity to just study with you, a Bible study, and just try to make things as clear as possible. Is that okay? So this evening, what we're going to do, I'm just letting you know that, so if you don't hear me just in a sermon kind of a, a, a way, uh, we're just going to be doing some teaching tonight. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the 2450 prophecy. How many by a show of hands have ever uh, heard of that prophecy? Okay, there's actually a few hands here. Now, uh, how many uh, understand the prophecy? Okay, so a lot fewer hands. How many know how to teach the prophecy? We're now down to one. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of a little process of elimination now. And that's, that's okay, and that's honest. Um, it's, it's, uh, sometimes these time prophecies can be a little bit complicated when you first hear about them. Um, one thing that uh, I'm convinced about, in order to understand prophecy uh, correctly, especially the things that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, is we have to understand the way that uh, William Miller thought, understand the Millerite thinking. Uh, that takes a little while to develop. The, way, the only way to really develop the Millerite mindset is by studying the Bible in the same way that they saw it, uh, studied it, to read what they wrote uh, and begin looking at things the way that they saw things. Because we know that they obviously looked at things correctly, didn't they? Yes or no? Yes. Obviously, because they illustrated these truths for us on these charts and so forth. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at the 2450 prophecy. But before we do that, I want to explain the 2520 prophecy a little bit more simply. Uh, for those who was, this is kind of new for, um, just to get the basics, the basic understanding of these prophecies. Now, how many of you have ever seen this prophecy chart here? All right, a few of you have seen this. This chart right here, whoops, sorry about that. How many of you seen that before? That's, ac that's right. That's actually, by the way, that's actually my family. It's my wife and my little ones right there. It's kind of a little bit dark. That's uh, myself, that's my wife. That's my son leaning up against me with his hands behind his head. And that's actually our front yard in the mountains of Montana. Wow. And uh, we're very thankful for the wonderful, blessed privilege that the Lord has opened up the door to be there. It's very peaceful. And it's uh, very, very conducive for uh, spiritual development. What's that? Yeah, we're on solar. Uh, we'll have to do the country living lecture later. Uh, but yeah, we, we're off grid up there. We're very remote and uh, um, have uh, very few neighbors. Our nearest neighbor is probably about a mile away. And we live about uh, seven and a half miles from the, near, from the nearest paved road. And we're, you know, we're up in the mountains. And so it's very, very nice. We're very appreciative of that. Um, and it's a blessing, especially with the type of uh, schedule, you know, and, and speaking and traveling quite extensively. It's so nice to have a place of refuge, uh, just to go back home and to be able to have a family uh, to go back to and just have peace. Uh, we can choose when we want to associate with people and when we don't uh, because we live so far away. Nobody can find us. So it's kind of nice, you know, so... And it really is. You know, the fact is people don't realize how much conflict you have when you're doing this type of ministry work. Uh, so sometimes it's actually kind of nice just to disappear for a little while in between speaking and just go have peace at your home. Uh, so I have a wonderful wife. I have three little babies at home. Um, of course, we had a son uh, last year that was stillborn, uh, but my wife is pregnant again. Uh, we are looking forward to another child being born this October. And so we're looking forward to um, uh, our fifth child together, our fourth one that will be home with us. Um, so please pray for a healthy uh, pregnancy and uh, uh, birth of this next little one. Um, so we're really, really uh, looking forward to that uh, next child joining our home. Um, as we look at this uh, prophecy study, <clears throat> this chart right here, uh, and I'll blow it up. I'll make it bigger and larger in just a moment. But this chart right here is actually published by Joshua Himes. Um, Joshua Himes was the, also the one that published this chart right here, the 1843 chart. If anybody has ever looked at this on the 18... What we call the 1843 chart was actually published in 1842. And on the top right there it says, 
a chronological chart of the visions of Daniel and John published by J.V. Himes, Joshua V. Himes, 14 Devonshire Street. And if you look at this one as well, you actually have the same thing, a pictorial chart of Daniel's vision arranged and published by J.V. Himes, 14 Devonshire Street in Boston. So J.V. Himes was the one who published this one. This chart was actually published before the 1843 chart. Now as we look at this one, it's very interesting. Um, before I make it any larger, because we're doing a, a little bit of a classroom study right now, all right? Because you kind of think about it as, as, a, as a college lecture. If you look at this chart right here, you'll notice uh, a few things that seem familiar. Uh, what are some things that uh, look familiar that you can recognize on this chart right here? Okay? Oh, okay, there you go, yeah. This is 2520 up there, 677. Eight, can everyone see that? 1843. Let me get a little... Uh, Get a little clicker here and a little laser light. If you just pardon me one moment. Sorry for going off camera. You don't have to pick me up down here. Here we have just that way I can point. So if you notice right there in the top right hand corner, it says 25, 26, 77, 1843. Just like that one. You see that? Yeah. And it also says seven Same times times 12 months. You see that right there? 84 uh, months times 30 days in a month of 25, 20. Same thing they have right there, right? 7, 12, 8. So, so there's some similar things. What else is similar on this chart? Oh, there's a that, that one's pretty obvious, isn't it? There's a statue of Daniel 2, and you see that stone coming out? That smoke coming off the stone. The stone's about to hit the feet. And what they did was they laid it out. They took the head. See that head of gold? And they did put the breast and arms of silver, and they, did, they put the belly and thighs of brass. See the two legs right there? And they put the feet and toes over here. What else is similar? Oh, yeah, there you go. You have the goat, you have the ram, the goat, and you also have the beast. There's pagan Rome, there's papal Rome, a little horn coming out of his head, just like right there. You see that? So we know, obviously, that the pioneers, Apollos Hale and Charles Fitch, Apollos Hale and Charles Fitch were the ones who published, uh, along with J.V. Himes. They're the ones that designed this chart. We can obviously see that when they designed this chart, they borrowed heavily from this one right here that Joshua Himes published first, right? Now, when you look at this one right here, I'm going to go ahead and blow it up now uh, because you'll see that there are timelines going across. You see that? Another one over there, another one over there. There's actually three time prophecies that they believe would end in 1843. Actually, four they believe in 1843 uh, because the 1335 ends in 1843. And they believe that three other ones ended. Now, we know that the date 1843 was incorrect. You all understand that? They didn't understand the full year concept, to make it simple, the zero year concept, uh, that there's no zero in between BC and AD. Now, that was the mistake on this chart right here. Now, the, if, can everyone see this? Is my computer a little bit in the way? Is that a little bit better? If everyone can see this right here, you'll see that the date 1335, that's from Daniel chapter 12, verse 12. The 1335, they dated from 508, the taking away of the daily, and that ends in 1843, and that's actually correct. All right, so this one is actually correct right here. The incorrect 1843s are actually right here and right here. You see this? The 2520, the 20, now why is 508 correct? Because it's AD. So from AD to AD, there's no zero year problem. So, but when you have a, a time prophecy going from BC to AD, you have to add that year that you lost from that zero, right? Okay, that assumed zero. All right, so let's look at this. So what are these other time prophecies that they have in here that they all believe would end on the same time? So let's blow it up now and let's go ahead and look at this. Let's look at the top line. Look at the top line here. Get a little bit bigger. You can all see this? What time prophecy is that up on the top? 2520. 20. Let's look a little bit closer. You read that? The seven times, yeah. or 25, 20 years, began in 677 B.C. and will end in 1843. Yeah. You got that? Yeah. Now, we already know that it should be 1844, right? Yeah. We're, but all we're looking at is now what time prophecy did they believe would end in that same time. We know it's 1844. So the first one they had was what? 2520, all right? So that's the first one. Let's go ahead and write that down. So the first one they believe would end... In 1843, it'll be the 2520. Now we're going to go all the way down here. And we know that all these time prophecies end when? 1844. 1844. Right? 
I didn't lose anybody yet, right? We're just barely getting started. So the 2520 ends in 1844. And the reason why is because it starts in 677. Now let me just say something very quickly for those who are just learning this. The 2520 prophecy is dealing with the scattering of God's people, the scattering of Israel, all right? Let me show this to you very quickly and then we'll go to the second prophecy. Is that all right? You don't all mind just an uh, a informal Bible study, do you? Let's go to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 26, and let's just explain the subject matter of the 2520 curse. Leviticus chapter 26, <clears throat> let's notice what it's talking about. I'm assuming that both of these are my waters under here. One is yours, do you know which one it is? No. Okay. That's a real brother for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 26, does anyone have any? Leviticus 26, let's go ahead and go there quickly. Um, does anybody have water, a, a new bottle? I'm saying that in a serious way. Does anybody have a... Thank you very much, brother. Thank you. Let's turn to Leviticus 26 quickly, please. Leviticus 26, and we're going to now look beginning with verse 20. Uh, let's actually pick it up right here in verse 14. Leviticus 26, beginning with verse 14. And uh, when you have that, please just say amen. amen. Now let's notice what the Bible teaches about this prophecy. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments... And if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you do what? If you break my covenant, I also will do this to you, unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning og that shall consume the eyes, cause sorrow of heart. You shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it, <clears throat> and I will set my face against you. You shall be slain before your enemies, they that hate you shall reign over you. And if you shall flee, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you, and if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I'll break the pride of your power. I'll make your heaven as iron, your earth as brass. We'll stop right there. Does this sound like a blessing or a curse? curse. So let's write a few things down. So, so far, the seven times prophecy, because the way they got the number 2520 is that a time is a year, right? And how many days are in a biblical year? Now, a biblical year... Does it go off the sun or does it go off the moon? Okay, we, we are on today, America, we're on a solar calendar which has 365 days a year, right? But the Jews, they went on a lunar cycle which is 360 days a year. And you can read that in Psalm 104, uh, Psalm 104, and I believe it's verse 16, if I'm not mistaken, where it says God appointed the moon for seasons, okay? So when you look at a lunar cycle, in a lunar cycle, how many days are in a month? So let's look at this very quickly. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate that. 30 days in a month. How many months in a year? 12. So how many days would be in a Jewish month? 360 days in a Jewish month, in a biblical month, are you, are, a year. Are you all with me, friends? And so 360 days in a year, if you have seven years or seven times, you would have seven times 360, which would be what? Are, are you all with me, friends? So seven prophetic times, or 2,520 years of judgment would pass over God's people if they did wickedness, wickedness if they broke the covenant. So let's write this down. The 2520 is dealing with the breaking of the covenant. What is the covenant? We just said, if you break my judgments, my commandments. Didn't it just say that in verse 15? Uh, we also know that in the book of Deuteronomy, if you just turn there very quickly, Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. I'll write this down in just a moment. Let's read it together. Deuteronomy 4 verse 13. <clears throat> Are we all there together, friends? Amen. The Bible says, and he declared unto you his what? I still hear pages turning. I'll just wait one moment. Now, we have to make sure to, even though this is a study method, I uh, can't lose all of you, okay? So just please make sure that you're follow, following along with me quickly. So Deuteronomy 4, verse 13. Are we all there? Amen. Amen. And he declared unto you his what? Covenant. His covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of 
stone. So the breaking of the covenants, the breaking of the Ten Commandments. So we look at the commandments, the Ten Commandments. You're all still with me, right? So if God's people would break the covenant, and if they would break the commandments, then the curse would come upon them, and the curse was the what? It was a 25-20. That, that what that means is that for 2,520 years, God's people would be under the curse. Okay, And we already studied that earlier, that under the curse would be uh, those two powers. The pagan powers, the papal powers would be trampling on God's people. His sanctuary, his host, the church would be trampled underfoot. Now, what this means is when we can find out the beginning date of this prophecy, we know the curse begins, right? And then when it ends, that means what? It ends. The judgment ends. The curse ends. And therefore, and let's look, uh, before we go any further, let me go ahead and give you one more scripture here in Leviticus 26 to get uh, the other subject matter of the prophecy. So please turn with me very quickly, please, back to Leviticus 26. <clears throat> Leviticus 26. And let's look at one more scripture uh, passage here, dealing with what the seven times is all about. I hope, you know, you all understand there's a whole lot more we could really go into this. What I'm doing is trying to give you the basics tonight rather than going into a whole bunch of information of which we could do. You know, this is, you know, all, the Bible's inexhaustible. So my purpose tonight is to try to give you some sim simplistic uh, understanding of some of these prophecies. Is that all right? Yes. So Leviticus chapter 26, and we're now going to drop it down to verse 27, our eyes to verse 27. And we'll pick it up here, and it says, And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also, how? In fury. In fury. So there's the anger of God, the wrath of God, the indignation of God. And that's why when Daniel talks about the indignation, is dealing with this right here. The indignation, the wrath, or the fury of God. I will walk contrary to you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you for how long? Seven, Seven times. times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. Now, did that happen to the Jews? Yes. Happened on many different occasions, didn't it? Yeah. I will destroy, uh, ultimately, the, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, was uh, a horrible fulfillment of this prophecy. And I will destroy your high, pla uh, uh, your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste and bring your what else? Sanctuaries unto desolation. <clears throat> so that means that when uh, we're dealing with the sanctuary being trampled underfoot, that would also be part of the 2520 curse. I will not smell the, the savior of your sweet odors. I will bring the land into desolation and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it and I will do what? Scatter. I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Now, uh, in just a moment, we'll read the next verse. So let's write this down. So what would God do? He would bring all these curses and what does it say right there in verse 33? What would he do to his people? He would scatter them. That's right. So the 2520 is dealing with the scattering of God's people. Are you all with me, friends? God's, and that's correct, God's denominated people. And we're told why they were denominated. They were denominated because of the Ten Commandment law. That was what made them special. But if they broke the Ten Commandments and they broke the covenant, then they would, not, they would, not, they would no longer be God's special denominated people. They will be scattered. Now here's the points of this prophecy, the 2520, dealing with the breaking of the covenant, the commandments, and the scattering, by the time it ends <clears throat> in 1844, what should you expect to start happening? Yeah. Yeah. You should expect in 1844 there to be a gathering of God's people. What kind of people? A denominated people. You would expect a gathering of a special people that would not break the covenant, but they would what? They would keep the covenant, so they would gather together, they would keep the covenant, which means they would have to keep all ten commandments. Is everyone still with me? Yes. Now, did that happen in 1844? Yes. Were there a people that began to be gathered together that entered into covenant with Jesus and began to keep all ten commandments, including the Sabbath? Yes. yes. 
Let me just say it very plainly. The 2520 prophecy is the prophecy that identifies the Seventh-day Adventist church as God's church. Yeah. You understand that, friends? Yeah. Uh, you know the 2300-day prophecy does not specifically identify the Seventh-day Adventist church as God's church. Yeah. You understand that, don't you? The 2300-day prophecy identifies that Jesus went into the most holy place in 1844. But it doesn't identify who the people are who went into the most holy place in 1844. So let's write that down as well. So let's skip the middle one. We're going to skip down to this one. We're, we're dealing with the ones we're most familiar with. So the next one we want to look at is the 2300-day prophecy. How many of you, ever understood, how many of you uh, understand that one? All right, so... Let's scroll down and see, did the, our pioneers have that one on this little chart as well? So let's scroll down. So we just got done looking at this one, 2520. Let's go down here to the bottom one. Let's go ahead and go down this way. And let's blow this up here. Can everyone see this? Is that a little bit better? Now, what animals do they have on the bottom one? They have the ram. They have the goat. They have the goat with four horns, the divisions. What, what uh, chapter of Daniel is that coming from? Daniel chapter 8, correct? Okay. And then when you keep on going over here, what prophecy is this up here that they have on the bottom one? The what? The 2300-day prophecy. And on this one as well, guess what else they have on this, on the corner? The daily. You see, our pioneers understood that the daily was directly connected with the 2300-day prophecy as well. We might talk about that tomorrow. How do we know that? Let's just look at the illustration on the chart. You see, you see right there, right in the middle? Can everyone see what that is right in the middle underneath the 2300-day prophecy? Can everyone see that, or do I need to make it larger? Make it a little bit larger. Whoops. That's, you see the dates right here? Well, hang on, hang on. You see, let's, let's, you see the dates? 508 and 538. Right here, if you actually look at that, it's kind of blurry when you get it bigger. But what it's dealing with, see if I can read that right here. It says paganism taken away and the papacy set up. This is dealing with the pagan sacrifices replaced by the papal sacrifices. So they understood that the daily was dealing with paganism, but it's very interesting that they looked at the fact that the papal sacrifices replaced the pagan, the pagan sacrifices, and that took place between 508 and 538. All right, so can you see that right there? All right, so the 2300-day prophecy. What was the 2300-day prophecy dealing with? We already looked at that earlier this morning. All right. Cleansing of the, so the sanctuary, right? I'm just going to put sanctuary first. Now, what was taking place with the sanctuary in Daniel 8.13? Let's go there very quickly. What was taking place in Daniel 8.13 with the sanctuary? Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13. Are we all there together, friends? Amen? Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain Satan which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the what else? The host shall be trodden underfoot, and he said to me, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Cleansed, or the word cleansed means justified or set right. Now we know the 20, we already learned early this morning, if you were following along with the, the, the service uh, this morning, we found out that the 2,300 uh, day prophecy was a part of or cut off from the 2520 prophecy, right? Now here the angel is simply asking what's going on with the sanctuary. The sanctuary would be trampled underfoot, would it not? And then after 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be made right. It would be justified. It would be cleansed. Okay? So the sanctuary is the subject of the 2300-day prophecy. We know that during the history of the 2300 days, 
as well as the 25, 20 days, the sanctuary was being trampled on. At the end of that history, in 1844, so we're going to just drop this all down. What takes place in 1844 with the sanctuary? Cleansed. There's a cleansing. Because we recognize that the most holy place, the sanctuary is not fully cleansed yet, is it? No. It's in the process of being cleansed. It's cleansing, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Jesus went in the most holy place. So the 2300 day prophecy, now follow me please. The 2300 day prophecy is dealing with the what? Sanctuary. 2520 prophecy is dealing with God's people, right? This is the host. In the Bible, a host means a people. So I'm gonna write, I'm just gonna circle that so you got that, and I'll circle this. Why were the people involved with this prophecy? What was it dealing with? The host or the people would be scattered because they broke the covenant of the commandments. So in 1844, the people would be gathered, a covenant would be established with them, and they would begin keeping the Ten Commandments again. Now, some people have had a struggle, and they say, well, why would the 2520 prophecy extend throughout the Christian dispensation? Anyone ever, you know, anyone heard that before? That was just dealing with ancient Israel. That wouldn't be dealing with the church. Of course it's dealing with the church, because the church was not keeping the commandments either. Right. Were they? No. The Ten Commandments were lost, were they not? Yeah. The Protestant Reformation didn't understand about the Sabbath. And so, as a result, the trampling continues. The trampling continues because they're still being disobedient to God's law. You understand this, friends? Yeah. So the trampling, the trampling down or the scattering will continue as long as there are people that are not keeping the covenant. So in 1844, the sanctuary begins the cleansing. The people begin gather, being gathered. There's a covenant established. The commandments begin being kept, including the Sabbath. But, he thought it was an earthly yes, which of course led to the mistake by William Miller thinking that the earth was the sanctuary. And therefore, Jesus must have to come in 1844. He, didn't, he did not understand what the sanctuary was. And that's why the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 4. When William Miller was awoken and he saw the candlesticks, what are these? I don't know what they are. He did not understand the sanctuary. It was a misunderstanding of the sanctuary that led to the great disappointment. All right? And it was a correct understanding of the sanctuary that led to a true gathering. Because as they were gathered, they understood the Sabbath. But they couldn't see the Sabbath until they understood the sanctuary. Why? Because the commandments are in the sanctuary in what compartment? In the most holy, in the most holy place. So as soon as the most holy place is opened up, now the commandments can be seen. And by the way, the pioneers quoted from Revelation eleven nineteen to prove that. Revelation 11, verse 19, if you just want to read that very quickly together, it says that there would come a time when the commandments would be seen in the heavenly sanctuary. Revelation eleven nineteen. 19. Now you're all still following along with me, correct? Yeah. All right. Am I making this simple enough for everyone? Yeah. Revelation eleven nineteen. 19, because we're about to get into the third prophecy that ended in 1844. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Revelation 11, and we're now going to look at, we'll just read one verse just for time's sake. Revelation 11, verse 19. <clears throat> the Bible says, are we there together, friends? Amen. Amen. And the temple of God was opened in Solomon's temple. Is that what it says? So wait a minute. That means that there is a temple where? Amen. In heaven. So there's a heavenly sanctuary. And there was now seen in his temple the candlestick, the showbread, the ark of his... What is the testament that was called? That was an old uh, language word for the covenant, the commandments, all right? The testimony. So the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices, thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Now look at the very first part of Revelation eleven nineteen. 19. Once again, whenever the sanctuary is opened up, now people can see what? The ark of his testament, which is where the Ten Commandments are, all right? So whenever the most holy place is opened up, that is when people can then understand the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, the binding claims of the, God's covenant. When did that happen, friends? <clears throat> in 1844, at the end of the 2300 days, when the sanctuary was opened up. And therefore, at the end of the 2520 days, 
there was people being gathered and people understanding and keeping the Ten Commandments and entering into covenant. Was that simple enough for everyone? So that's two witnesses. But it's interesting that the Bible says <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 19, go there very quickly, Deuteronomy chapter 19, now we're going to get into the third prophecy. Deuteronomy chapter 19, <clears throat> and we'll read just one verse, we'll read verse 15. Deuteronomy, the fifth book in your Bible, chapter 19, verse 15. The Bible says this, Deuteronomy 19, 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So when you want to establish a matter, you have to have at least what? Two or three witnesses. Now, is it important to establish the date of 1844. Yes. 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 You know, our, our entire identity is wrapped up in that date. You know that, don't you? Yes. That's why all of the hellish uh, attacks against that date. That was the entire purpose of Desmond Ford uh, and others that would deny the sanctuary because if you can deny the sanctuary, then you, then you deny 1844 and then the whole great disappointment, the Advent movement was a great delusion. They had all the prophecies wrong. Are you with me, friends? It's one thing to another. So 1844 has to be established. Now, you know what's interesting is that there are several prophecies that establish 1798. Yes? yes. <clears throat> I'll write them down here in the bottom. Well, we have one, which is the 1260. Yes? The 1260, which is the last half of the 2520, that goes from 538 to, to 1798, right? Yep. And of course, if you take that back even further to the date 723, when Israel went into captivity, that was another 1260 right there, wasn't it? Yes. And those two dates together is 25, 20 years, which ends in 1798. Now, before anybody gets confused, if you're watching this for the first time or just learning a little bit more, there are two 2520 prophecies because the nation of Israel was divided in half during the reign of uh, Solomon's son, uh, Rehoboam. Are you all familiar with that story right there? Rehoboam re uh, basically uh, refused to accept the counsel of the elders, and Jeroboam was given 10 tribes. He was given 10 tribes, and Judah... Uh, Jeroboam was kept, gave ten tribes. Rehoboam, who was the king of Judah now in Jerusalem, kept two tribes, which were Judah and Benjamin. The ten tribes, which we now call Israel, or the northern kingdom, sometimes called by the name of Ephraim in the Bible, they went into captivity in 723 when Hosea was taken a prisoner by the king of Assyria. All right, did you all just get that right there? So from 723 to 1798, that's a 2520 judgment or scattering on the northern tribes. They were never gathered, by the way. They never came uh, back as a nation. But after 1798, there was an initial gathering, wasn't there? Yes. During the Millerite history. Then when you take the second uh, 2520 for which kingdom? Judah, the southern kingdom. They went into captivity in 677 when Manasseh was taken as a prisoner by the Assyrian king to Babylon. How many of you are familiar with this history right here? Now, if you're not familiar with this, you can go ahead and get some, a lot of material out there about this. I'm just giving you a basic understanding right now. So from 677 A.D., 2,520 years later, would then end when? 1844. So you have 22520 prophecies. Now, we look at these prophecies of 70... What's that? What did I say? Oh, thank you. You know, it's kind of funny, you know, you always ask people, you know, uh, don't take the preacher's word for it and be Bible scholars. And when they correct you, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, a little shocking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's good. So 6, thank you very much. So 677 BC, my mistake. So 677 BC, 2,520 years later, brings you down to 1844. Now we're looking at 7098. So, so far we have 1260 years ending in 7098, right? We have another 2520 
ending in 7098 from 723. And then we also have the 1290. And the 1290 was from the time that the daily would be taken away, which is 508. Are you all with me, friends? And 508, 1290 years later, would also bring it down to 1798. So how many witnesses is that for 1798? Three. You have three witnesses for 1798. Now, which date do you think is uh, more important, 1798 or 1844? It's kind of a trick question because they're both important. Because 1798 was the first angel's message. 1798 was the opening of the little book of Daniel. You can't have an 1844 without a 1798. Okay? So if you have three witnesses to establish 1798, is 1844 less important than 1798? No. no. So if there are three witnesses to establish 1798, in my mind, I would like to see three witnesses to establish 1844. Right? How many witnesses do we have so far? Two, the 2520 from 677 B.C. to 1844. And the second one is the, when did that one start? That was the decree to restore and build Jerusalem by Artaxerxes. By the way, if you want this information, uh, and you would, if you'd like a study guide to go along with this, they're right here. <laughs> okay? It's all right there, friends. There's 677 up there. There's 457. There's a 1290, the 1335, and on and on it goes. Okay, so now we're going to get into the crux of the matter, and that is, what could the third witness be? Well, let's look at this chart. How's that? Let's go ahead and shrink this back up. Now, we've already gone over the first line, right? All right, so there was the first one. What was the top one? 20 by 20. What was the bottom one? The honored. What is this middle one? <laughs> well, let's look at it. How's that? Let's go ahead and blow this up and look at what it says right there in the middle. Forty-nine jubilees or two thousand four hundred and fifty years. Now, what on earth is that all about? Well, let's look at it now. This is going to be the rest of our study. So far, have you all followed me to this point? Yeah? yeah? All right. So can I start talking faster now? <laughs> all right. I'll keep it simple. 2,450 as we do this class. 2,450 years or the cycles of the Jubilee. Now, does anyone know... Uh, what the Jubilee was dealing with. Restoration. Yes. restoration of what? Not, no, it's not the restoration of Israel. The 2520 was dealing with the restoration of Israel. It's not the restoration of the sanctuary. It's not the restoration of the Sabbath either because the Sabbath was restored in the 2520. Remember the covenant was reestablished? The restoration of the land. Okay? So this is dealing with the land. Now, this is an interesting study here. We're going to go into this now as we turn back to Leviticus, but now we're going to pick it up in chapter 25. Now, we all believe that the uh, Bible is uh, an inspired book. It's a consistent book. Leviticus 26 is a 2520. What comes before Leviticus 26? Leviticus 25. Now, Leviticus 20, chapter 25 was the chapter that William Miller was studying from when he began understanding this, these cycles of sevens. Now, the way that we know that uh, William Miller studied this first is because of his conversion testimony, his story. Um, he was a deist. Um, he was actually raised uh, in, in a Christian home, but he chose to make the wrong friends and associates. Does that sound familiar in today's uh, life, uh, today's church? Yes, it does, and oftentimes young people have a struggle with that. So William Miller began getting the wrong associates, and as a result, uh, he ended up giving up his faith uh, in the Bible, and uh, he actually uh, became a deist, uh, which, of course, spiritualizes many things away. Freemasons are deists and so forth. But he was an upright man in his character. He was an honest man. He was searching and seeking. He had many uh, positions of public trust. He was a constable. He was a sheriff. He was a judge. He was also a captain uh, in 
the military that fought, he fought in the Battle uh, of Lake Champlain uh, in 1814, um, I believe it was. Now shortly after this, now this was the, the battle with the British, the War of 1812, but in 1814 was the Battle of Lake Champlain. And in the Battle of Lake Champlain, he fought with, I believe the statistic was, they had right around 5,000 regular American troops. And then of course, the American military back then was, um, was uh, by and large a civilian volunteer force, what we call today a militia. He had 5,000 troops versus the British Army's 15,000. Okay, so it was three to one odds. And this was, you know, something that uh, you pretty much just signed, you know, you went ahead and said your prayers and you're going to go in there and get slaughtered. Uh, so they went in to defend their country, the newly found, uh, the fought for freedom in the Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, and they won. Not only did they won, but they won by such overwhelming odds against the British, outnumbered three to one, that William Miller wrote his soon-to-be wife at that time, and he said that he saw a greater hand than man in that battle. And that was what caused him to go back and start studying divine providence working with human affairs. Because see, deists kind of think that there's a, they, they, they believe there's a God, but that he's kind of not really personal in our lives. He's created the laws of the universe, and he just kind of lets us, let, kind of lets us go and lets the laws kind of take care of themselves. So as a result, they don't really have any accountability. So what he did was he went back and said, wait a minute, I saw the hand of a God in this war. As a result, when he went back uh, in 1814 and he came back out of the war, in 1816 he was converted, he was born again, and he joined the Baptist Church. How many of you are familiar with the story of William Miller? It's really a phenomenal story. Uh, there's different uh, videos out there, documentaries, and also, of course, the book Great Controversy, which has a story as well. In 1816, he began studying the Bible. Does anyone know why he began studying the Bible? No, 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 not in 1816. He didn't, he didn't try to prove it wrong in 1816 because now he's converted. What was he trying to do now? He was trying to prove something wrong, but not the Bible wrong. He was trying to prove his friends wrong because he still had Dia's friends. And these Dia's friends began asking them questions. How many of you ever, you know, when you became Christians, your, uh, your friends began asking you a bunch of questions about it, right? Challenge you on it. Anybody had that experience before? Oh, if this is really true, what about this, what about that, right? So William Miller said, you know what? I, I believe the Bible's true. I believe it's God's where I want to see, you know, understand this book and get answers from my friends. So he went back and studied the Bible for at least two solid years. It was, he says it was between 1818 or 1819 that he came to his conclusions. So two years. It was at this time that he studied all these things. Now, does anyone know how he studied the Bible? Yes, the concordance. Yes, true. Oh, I, guess what, what, I guess what I mean... Okay. <laughs> okay, now all of you are saying correct things, but I was actually looking for that one back there, is that he started Genesis. at the beginning of his Bible. Okay? He started in Genesis, and he writes that he went no further and no faster than he could understand. And so he says that whole days, whole nights were consumed in the study of the Word of God. And so he went from Genesis to what book? Oh yeah, Revelation, but what book is after Genesis? Exodus. Exodus. And then after he studied Exodus, he came to do what book? Now it's very interesting because I believe it was God's divine plan for this man to study the Bible this way. Because in the book of Genesis was where he started coming across the seven years of famine, the seven years uh, of serving for Leah, seven years serving for Rachel, uh, uh, um, Jacob bowing down seven times before Esau. He started seeing all these patterns, right? And then he went to the book of Exodus, and in, then Leviticus. And by the time he got to Leviticus, he went to Leviticus chapter 25. And what's after Leviticus 25? 26. Leviticus chapter 26. You have seven times. But guess what's in Leviticus 25? It's a bunch of cycles of sevens as well. Now what number does seven, or who, the number seven, to whom does it belong? God. It belongs to God. It belongs to the wonderful numberer, does it not? So let's go to Leviticus 25 and look at this and find out what the Jubilee is dealing with. Leviticus 25, as we deal now with the Jubilee and the sacred cycle of seven. Leviticus 25. And we're going to pick it up right here. <clears throat> let's just pick it up right here in verse 1. Leviticus 25, beginning with verse 1. And when you have that, amen? Amen. 
The Bible says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So wait a minute, who's keeping the Sabbath here? The land is supposed to keep a Sabbath here. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in which year? In the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine and dress, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant, for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be for me. So, so far, before we read the next verses, because the next verses are the important ones for the study, but so far, just to get a basic understanding, how many years were they able to work the land? Six, Six years, and they had to let the land rest on the yes. seventh year, right? Yes. Now, stop right there and churn very quickly to Leviticus chapter 26 again, and let's find out what would happen to them if they refused to let the land rest. Leviticus chapter 26, and let's pick it back up here in verse 28. Leviticus 26 and verse 28. Are we there, friends? Amen? Then I will walk contrary to you also in fury, and I, even I will chastise you for how long? Seven. Seven times for your sins. Drop your eyes down to verse 32. I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it, and I will what? Scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Why? Verse 34. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. So the seven times curse of the law came upon them because they broke what? Well, yes, the covenant, but what was part of that? They broke the what? The land Sabbath rest. Are you all with me, friends? So we're going to find out in our study tonight that when they went into captivity in Babylon for 70 years, it was because they had broken a specific number of Sabbath years. All right, we're going to look at that and prove it in just a minute. All right, so is everyone still with me? Let's turn back now to the previous chapter and let's get into the Jubilee cycles now. Leviticus 25, and we're picking it back up now in verse 8. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to write this down, okay? The 2450 is dealing with the land, is dealing with the seventh what? Year. year good. The seventh year <clears throat> Sabbath. This was for the land. Leviticus, pardon me, Leviticus chapter 25, we'll pick it now up in verse 8. <clears throat> now let's notice what God's plan was. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee, how long? Forty-nine years. 49 years. And then after the cycle of seven times seven, forty-nine years, then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound, on which day? The tenth day, the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of? Atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land under the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in itself. And this drop down to verse 13. In the year of the jubilee ye shall return every man unto his possession. Now notice what would happen after 49 years, there would be a 50th year, which was called the Jubilee, right? So let's write this down. So how many years will there be? There will be 49 years. Yes or no? Yes. And then in the 50th year, there would be the Jubilee. 
And in, in the year of Jubilee, every man would return to his possession and be rejoined to his family. Amen. Okay? Now, you're, you're going you're to pick this up in a little bit here, right? So, the land will be restored. And every man will be restored to his family, right? Let's put family reunion. How's that sound? Does that sound good? Amen. Now, can anyone guess ultimately what this is dealing with? <clears throat> this is ultimately dealing with when Christ comes and all families are restored to the resurrection. Okay? This is what it's really dealing with. This is what the Millerites thought it would, also believed it was dealing with. Okay? Now, let's move on here. Now what I want to do is show you the thinking of the Millerite mind in understanding the Jubilee cycles. So how many cycles of sevens were there? Seven times seven, right? 49 years, and then in the 50th year will be the, uh, the Jubilee, and the trumpet will be blown on the 10th day of the seventh month, right? And let me show you something that William Miller actually writes, which I find, uh, you'll find very interesting. This right here is a synopsis of William Miller's views. Let me see if I can center this. I may have to, uh, there we go. Is that a little bit better? Okay, and I want you to notice what, this is William Miller's uh, 14th belief. These are all of the beliefs as he's talking about. Um, here's what I believe and here's how I prove it. Um, we're only gonna look at the belief number 14. I believe the time can be known by all who desire to understand and to be ready for his coming. And I am fully convinced that sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844, according to the Jewish mode of computation of time, Christ will come and bring all his saints with him and that they, then he will reward every man as his work shall be. Now we already know that he, uh, number one, uh, they misunderstood the, uh, the computation of time and so the Jewish year uh, this was the Jewish year of 1843 that they believed Christ would come in. You all, how many of you understand this, uh, this history here? And so therefore, it was the day after, it was March 22nd, 1844, that they had their first disappointment. And then they understood that they were in the tearing time, went back and studied the Bible, and then they came to the conclusions later on that Jesus would come in the 10th day of the 7th month in 1844. Now let's how, see how he proves it. How do, you, how do you prove that, William Miller? Well, he says this, number one, I prove it by the time given by Moses in the 26th chapter of Leviticus, being seven times that the people of God are to be in bondage to the kingdoms of this world. Or in Babylon, literal and mystical. Which seven times cannot be understood less than seven times 360 revolutions of the earth in its orbits? Making 2,520 years. Now we don't want to move on uh, down on all this because we've already talked about the 2520. Number two, it is proved typically by the year of release. At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact of it his neighbor or his brother, but it, because it is called the Lord's release. At the end of seven years, let she go every man his brother a Hebrew, which has been sold to you. When he has served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free from thee. But your fathers hearken not unto me, nor incline their ear. So what he's saying here is that the seven years of slavery was a type of the seven times as well. Are you getting this right here? So when, when William Miller saw the number seven, he saw a lot more than we see today. We are, by this type, taught that the people of God will be delivered from their servitude and bondage when they have served their seven prophetic years. You see that? So William Miller likened the seven years of bondage of a Hebrew slave to the seven times of bondage to the heathen kings by the Israelites. Are you with me, friends? Now we want to move on past this. Number three. It is also proved by that we're going to move on past this because I don't want to get, start getting confusing for people. He says it's also proved by the sign of the Sabbath. Now let's go look and see what he says about the Sabbath. Okay, number five, here it is. Number five, again, we can prove it by the typical Jubilee. Leviticus 25, 8 through 13. We just read that. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee 49 years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of atonement. Now let's drop on down here. Now, if we can show any rule whereby we can find the antitype, we can tell when the people of God will come into the inheritance of the purchased possession, the redemption of their bodies, and the trump of Jubilee will proclaim liberty, a glorious one, through all the land. You hear what he just said? I'm going I'm to stop right there and let you catch up with me. Did you all get what he just said right there? 
He's saying that the Jubilee was dealing with the inheritance of the heavenly Canaan land and the redemption of our bodies or the resurrection. Yeah. The family reunion and the restoration of the land. You get that? Yeah. This is what he's saying here. Now, we're going to deal with the issue of 1844. Because what we're going to find out is that 1844 was not the end of what these things were pointing to. They were the beginning of what these things were pointing to. All right? So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, there are seven kinds of Sabbaths, which all have seven for a given number. The Jews kept but six Sabbaths. If they had kept the seventh, they would have been made perfect without us, but they broke the seventh. Therefore, there remains a keeping of the Sabbath of the people of God. Now, here's the Jewish Sabbath, according to William Miller. Are you ready for this? Are you all still with me? Did I? Yeah, yeah. All right. Number one, the seventh day. Was that a Sabbath? Yes. yes, that's one Sabbath. Wouldn't it make sense that God would have seven types of Sabbaths? Yeah. Why? Seven is God's divine number. So the first Sabbath that the Jews had was the seventh day. The second Sabbath that the Jews had was the 50th day. Remember the 50th day? Was that the day of Pentecost? It would be the day, it would be a Sabbath. The seventh week, the seventh month, the seventh year, which was the land rest, the seven times seven years and 50th jubilee, did we already read that right now? Yeah. But now notice the seventh one which he comes to. Seven times seven jubilees and 50th jubilee will bring us to a complete or perfect Sabbath. The great jubilee of jubilees. <laughs> Thus seven times seven 50 years is 49 times 50 <clears throat> equaling 2,450 years. Did you get that? Or did, you go, did you go over your head or did you get it? No. Let me explain what he's saying here. What he's saying is that, look, I've been studying the Bible. God works on cycles of seven. Yes or no? Yes. Follow the thinking here. Follow the thinking. Number one, he says, wait a minute. I studied the 2520. That was the first prophecy he actually understood. He says that. The 2450 was something apparently he understood later on. He understood the cycles of sevens to come to the seven times. But in his writings, he writes about the 2520 and then the 2300 days first. And so in my mind, it means that he must have understood the 2450 a little bit later as far as a time prophecy. But the 2520... Looking at this cycle of seven, this was dealing with the gathering, right? The 2300 day prophecy dealing with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, what did William Miller think the sanctuary was? Earth. Earth. So he thought that the cleansing of the sanctuary would be the coming of Jesus Christ. Cleansing the earth by fire, right? right. So he said, wait a minute, I have one evidence. The 2300 day prophecy, well, Christ will come and burn the earth up. The second evidence I have for the coming of Christ is the 2520. Are you with me, friends? Well, actually, I should reverse it. The first evidence was actually 2520. The second evidence was 2300 days. But the point is, the 2300 day prophecy said, well, Christ will come and he'll cleanse the earth by fire, the sanctuary. The 2520 is the gathering. God will gather his people from the four winds and he'll take them back to heaven. This is William Miller's thinking. Are you with me, friends? Yeah. And the third evidence is the Jubilee that after 2,450 years, the land will be restored and we'll be having a great family reunion, the resurrection. Are you with me, friends? Yeah. Now, he had all three prophecies correct, but he had, he had the fact that the events were speaking about the beginning of the... He had the sanctuary wrong, but he had the fact, the fact wrong that these prophecies were not dealing with the end of these events. They were dealing with the beginning of these events. Are you all with me, friends? For example, did the sanctuary end cleansing in 1844? No. Or did the beginning of the cleansing begin in 1844? Did the gathering end in 1844? Or did the gathering begin in 1844? And it's the same thing with the 2450. When you look at the land being restored, now we know that the resurrection will take place at the end when the Day of Atonement is completed. So in other words, in 1844... Something did begin to happen with the land. And we'll prove the time prophecy in just a minute. But something did happen to the land in 1844. Does anyone know? Who was the land supposed to go back to in the, in the typical service? Back to the rightful owner. Who is the rightful owner of all the land? Christ. Are you with me, friends? What happened in 1844 when Jesus went into the most holy place, according to early writings, 
the vision of the 2300 days, the end of the 2300 days. We told that he told the disciples, the people, he said, wait here, I'm going in to receive my kingdom. Now, has he fully received his kingdom yet? Why? Think with me, friends. He has to have subjects, a host, people. Are you with me, friends? So in 1844, the land began the restoration by God the Father saying, Son, the land is actually yours. Are you with me, friends? He goes in to receive his kingdom, but the kingdom is not fully received until he's made up the last of his subjects. So in 1844, he began making up his subjects that would inherit the land. He began making up the subjects that would have the family reunion. He began judging the dead. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And looking over the books, okay, blotted out. He's my son. He's my subject. Are you with me, friends? And the next one, okay, book of death. Oh, book of life. Some are accepted. Some names are rejected, we're told. He begins making up his kingdom. So before we go any further, do you understand that point right there? Yes. So the rest of the study, what we're going to do is we're just going to prove the starting and ending date of the, of the 2450. But you have to get the whole point. The whole point is that all of these prime time prophecies were witnessing to the date 1844 when all these events would begin. You got that? But all of these things will have an end when the events come to an end. When the sanctuary is fully cleansed, it's because he, the gathering is fully accomplished. The covenant has been fully accepted by God's people. The number of his kingdom is fully made up and therefore the land will now be fully restored and there will be a, the grand family reunion in the day of Jubilee. Are you with me, friends? Amen. So when the trumpet of the Jubilee was blown on the 10th day of the seventh month, we have to understand that it actually wasn't blown at the beginning of the Day of Atonement. It was, it was blown at the end of the Day of Atonement when all sins were now cleansed. Are you with me, friends? So we're waiting for the full fulfillment of the Jubilee. Are we not? Are we waiting for the full fulfillment of the Jubilee? I'll say that one more time. The trumpet of the Jubilee was blown on the 10th day of the seventh month we recognize that it was not blown at the beginning of the 10th day when the Day of Atonement began. It was blown at the end of the 10th day when it was pronounced that they were now clean on the great day of Jubilee. Are you with me? Yes, there was. But as I've studied that further, the trumpet that was blown in the beginning was the seventh trump. And the seventh trump, I've said, matter of fact, I think it was in Idaho, I said that the seventh trump was a trump of Jubilee. And I want to correct that because, and studying further, the trumpet of the Jubilee could not fully be blown until all sins have been blotted out which would be the last trump. The last trump when Michael descends with a shout, that's the jubilee when the land is restored and the family reunion takes place. Are you with me, friends? So the jubilee, the seventh trump, is blown on the beginning of the tenth day of the seventh month. The trumpet of the jubilee is blown on the end of the tenth day of the seventh month, at the end of the Day of Atonement. Remember, the tenth day of the seventh, listen, friends, the tenth day of the seventh month is a type. Yes or no? It is a type that covers a period of time in the anti-type. Do you understand that, friends? Yeah. For example, does the, does the anti-typical Day of Atonement take place in one literal day? No. no, obviously not, because 1844 and it's still going on, right? So the seventh trump points you into the most holy place where sins are being blotted out. That's, that was Revelation chapter 10, the seventh angel. But there's another trump. Is there not? Yeah. What trump is that? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. rise first. So that is the trump. The last trump is actually the trump of the Jubilee when everyone actually inherits the land. However, this prophecy still that points to 1844, these events still began in 1844 when he went in to receive his kingdom. The events do not end until the Day of Atonement is over. The cleansing of the sanctuary began in 1844. It doesn't end until the Day of Atonement is over. The gathering and the covenant and the Ten Commandments began when Christ went in 1844, but the gathering ends as Christ ends the Day of Atonement. Did you all just get that, friends? Yes. So these are all types. Now, what about, so can I move on now to the actual mechanics of the prophecy itself? Have you all been following along pretty, pretty good so far? You all still awake? Yeah. All right. Just making sure. Sometimes people are used to uh, more animated talks. I want to make sure that you're not just having uh, weariness and so forth. Let's go on. I'm going to shrink this down. And now we're going to study the actual time prophecy itself. Can I, can I erase all that now? 
Yeah? yeah. All right, I, I, need, I do need to illustrate something else now. Oops. I'm going to uh, put this like this. Okay, so make sure to get your pens and papers out as we deal with the time prophecy itself. It's going to be very interesting, actually. How much time do I have left on the camera? Do you, do you have any idea? Brother uh, Edgar, can you, can you go peek at that and just make sure? Uh, we don't want my time to run out. I just want to make, be cognizant of the time on the camera. While he's looking at that, you may want to go ahead and uh, get your papers and pens out as we deal with this. Uh huh. So what would my understanding would be that the shofar was blown on the beginning of the day of a trumpet, and the silver trumpets were most likely blown afterward. And the reason why I would say that is because Ellen White had a vision of Christ coming on the cloud, and he had a silver trumpet in his hand. So the silver trumpet would be used at the end of the day of atonement, right. and it would be used on the tenth day of the seventh month to sound the trumpet of the jubilee. Right. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, we know that the Feast of Tabernacles is a little bit different as well, because the Feast of Tabernacles took place a few days after on the 15th day. And the Feast of Tabernacles symbolized actually inheriting the kingdom of God, uh, you know, the uh, coming back to eat and rest. So the Jubilee was a type of that as well, but we enter into the Jubilee first. And I believe we start celebrating the Jubilee uh, during the, uh, when Christ comes, the seven days ascending to the city of God. Uh, so we're actually already rejoicing because we had a family reunion. Testing one, two. Is that good? All right. Um, just for the sake of the, how long has it been off? Was it just right now that it went off? Yeah. All right. Well, for the sake of the camera, since it's still rolling, I'll repeat what I just said because people probably got frustrated right now. You know, you're watching a DVD and, ah! Oh! So let me just repeat that very quickly. There was a comment made about the shofar being blown and then the silver trumpets being there in the sanctuary. Uh, and we can liken that, the shofar being blown uh, in the beginning of the Day of Atonement. They were also blown during the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, that was the 10 days preceding the Day of Atonement, uh, which would take place on the first day of the seventh month. So the shofar was the, the, the trumpets of warning, and there were the trumpets of preparation, uh, heart preparation, so that you could be able to go and uh, send your sins beforehand to the sanctuary. Uh, the silver trumpets would be blown after the Day of Atonement was completed as a result of a sign of the great jubilee, the sign that God has accepted his people, and uh, sins have now been blotted out. So in the anti-typical Day of Atonement, the shofars have already been blown. They're still being blown, tip, uh, uh, spiritually speaking, with the messages preparing us to have our sins blotted out. The silver trumpet is not blown by the watchmen. The silver trumpet is blown by Jesus. And we know that because Mrs. White had the vision of when he comes back. He's on a cloud. He has the, the, hair, the curly hair on it laying on his shoulders. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He has in his one hand a sickle, and he has a silver trumpet, we're told in the other hand. Anybody ever read that before? So the silver trumpet will be the symbol that the Day of Atonement is completed and now the Great Jubilee has begun. And the Great Jubilee, a celebration of a family reunion. When is the family reunion for us? The resurrection. The first resurrection and the special resurrection and translation, the great family reunion where we get to be able to meet with all of our loved ones who have died in Christ, all those who have died since 1844, under the third angel's message, we've been able to also meet those uh, who we've never met before. It's going to be pretty interesting, isn't it? <coughs> you know, I, I look forward to that day. I think that's going to be more glorious than we can ever imagine. You know, there's some times when I'm reading my Bible or spending special time with Jesus, and my heart will be overwhelmed with just a sweet sense of peace. Has anyone ever had that experience before where you're just enraptured in the love of God, and you feel the peace of God is washing over you, and you just don't want to leave? And you know, and it, 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 there, that, friends, is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little 
smidgen of a foretaste of the overwhelming peace and love and joy that will wash over our souls throughout all of eternity. Friends, heaven will be cheap enough. Can you say amen, friends? Amen. And then, of course, when we get to heaven, we'll get to enjoy the Feast of Tabernacles uh, and the millennial rest and so forth. All right, now let's go ahead and go into our last point. I think I have about 20 minutes or so left, correct? So let's go ahead and now break down the actual prophecy of the 49 uh, Jubilees. So we're going back to Leviticus chapter 26. <clears throat> if you would please do me a favor and give me like a five-minute warning, um, that way I don't get cut off on the camera. Leviticus chapter 26. Let's go back there, friends. We have to go quickly because of time's sake. Leviticus chapter 26. And we'll now look at the Jubilee Cycles. Leviticus chapter 26. And when you're there, please say amen. amen. I'm sorry, did I say 26? Yes. I meant 25. Pardon me. Leviticus chapter 25. Thank you very much. Amen. Leviticus 25. And now we'll go to verse 8. The Bible says this. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. The space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be forty-nine years. And thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. All right. So let's look at this. Forty-nine cycles of seven. First of all, we have seven times seven would equal, go into a Jubilee, right? Be forty-nine years, right? right. And then the fiftieth year plus the fiftieth year. You would enter into the Jubilee. What William Miller did is William Miller said, well, God works on cycles of seven, so let's go ahead and look at the cycles of sevens. The number 49 is a cycle of seven. So he said, what would happen if we had a perfect cycle of Jubilee? What would happen if we had 49 cycles of 50-year Jubilees? Did you just get that right there? So he said, what would happen if we had a perfect number of Jubilees, 49 cycles of 50 years? Every 50 year, 50th year is a jubilee, right? So if you take that, 49 cycles of a jubilee, because a 50th year is a jubilee, right? So if you take 49 cycles of jubilee years, you come to 2,450 years, which he thought would get you to a jubilee of Jubilees. Are you with me? This would be called the Great Jubilee. And he was partially correct. The reason why he was partially correct is because Jesus did not come in 1844 like he thought. But the beginning of the cycles began. Are you with me, friends? Yeah. So 2,450 years. Now the question is, well, how on earth, where do we start that from? Where do you come up with the date to start that from? Now, what do we find would happen if the people did not let the land rest? Land rest? What would happen? they will be carried into captivity. Now, how many years were they in captivity to Babylon? 70 years. They were there for 70 years, right? Now, follow me, friends. Come on, I need you to really think now. So there's 70 years that they're in captivity, right? Why were they in captivity for 70 years? What do we read in Leviticus 26? Go to Leviticus 26. Let me give you two scriptures. Leviticus 26, and then we're going to go to 2 Chronicles. Leviticus 26, verse 34. Why were they there for 70 years? Leviticus 26, verse 34. Are we there, friends? Amen. Amen. Then shall the land... We'll get there in just one moment. But thank you. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lie desolate and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. So, so why were they in there? Why were they in the land? Not letting the land rest for Sabbath, Right? Let me give you one more scripture, then we're going to break this down. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And we're going to look right here at verse... We don't have time to read all the verses, but please write down for your notes. Write down verses 17 through 21. 2 Chronicles 36 verses 17 to 21. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when you read the context from verse 17 down, we're dealing with Nebuchadnezzar coming and breaking down the walls of Jerusalem and carrying people away into captivity. Let's go ahead and read just two verses, verse 20 and 21. Are we there together? Yeah. Amen. 
And them that had escaped from the sword carried away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill how many years? Three. Seventy years. Three score and ten years. So here's the point. The 70 years were to make up for the time that they were not allowing the land to rest before, right? right? Now, let's break this down. How many years, or let, let me just say it this way. There was a cycle, right? There were six, day, six years you work, seventh year you rest, right? right. So every seventh year <clears throat> would be a yearly Sabbath rest. Yes or no? So 70 years they were in captivity, that means that they broke 70 yearly Sabbaths. Did you all get that, friends? Yeah. <clears throat> so let's do that. 70 times 7, they broke every, every seventh year they broke the Sabbath. And seven more, six, six more years ago by, the seventh year, they broke that Sabbath. So let's get this, let's, let's get this down. Let me make sure your, your minds are working with me, all right? Israelites come to the land, right? First six years they're there. The seventh year, they broke the Sabbath. That's one year of captivity. They broke, that, they broke that seventh year. You ready? You got that? Then they break another one. So then the 14th year, they're in the land. They break the 14th year. And that's two years now in the captivity because you now broke two cycles of seven. They're there in the land for 21 years. They broke the third cycle. That's three years in captivity. Are you with me, friends? So the very fact that they were there for 70 years means that they broke 490 years worth of Sabbaths. Did you get that? For 490 years, they were breaking every seventh year. For, for 490 years, every seventh year, they were disregarding the Sabbath laws. Now the question is why? Does anyone know why? Oh yes, they didn't let the land rest. You're correct. Huh? They didn't listen to Samuel. Why? What didn't they listen to Samuel about? They chose a king... And the king took their land from them and would not allow the land to rest. Are you all with me, friends? Now, how much time do I have? I have is that correct? I only have nine minutes? And then it's going to wrap up? Wow. All right. I'm going to I'm gonna have to uh, cut this down a whole lot. Now, you all know that who was the first king? Saul. Saul. They rejected the prophet, they got a king, and you remember that Samuel warned, for time's sake, I, I have to go for, is that okay with everybody? I, I gotta move a little bit further, and you can go ahead and look this up later on. But you can go back and read 1 Samuel, and you can look at the warning. Samuel said, look, if you get a king, here's what he's gonna do for you, do to you. He's gonna take your sons, he'll take your daughters, he'll take your land, he'll take your vineyards, remember that? Yeah. So, the, so the very fact, now if he had been a good king, he would have kept the Sabbath rest laws. But because Saul was a bad king, are you all with me, friends? Yeah. And guess what? Because they rejected the divine plan of God and got a king to begin with, all the kings broke those laws. Right. Every one of them broke the Sabbath laws for the land. David let's look at this now. Yes, David did as well. So let's look at this. Now, here's the question. When did Saul become king? Because if you know when Saul became king, you then count down 490 years of breaking... The Sabbath laws, and you find out when the 2450 begins. Are you all with me, friends? Let me go ahead and give you a, a reference real quick. I, I need to move on a lot quicker here. Let me go ahead and give this to you from Joshua Himes. Let's see here. This is Joshua Himes. And here's the reference right here. September 18th. September 18th, 1844. Joshua Himes. What, what was happening during that time right there? What was happening during this, these, these months of August, September, and October of 1844? The midnight cry. All right? So this understanding was a part of the midnight cry. Notice what he says. In this case, however, as in all other cases, in which indeed, I need to, uh, let's see. There is no such authority for this chronological applic application. It is difficult to point out the fulfillment, blah, 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 blah. All right, now what he's trying to look at is the period of the neglected sabbatical years. True, we may fairly suppose that period to terminate with a captivity of 607 B.C. and 70 years, the period of the captivity will be equal to the sabbatical years or 490 years. 
Remember we just did that? Four, yeah. So 490 years added to 607 is 1097. According to the marginal chronology, 1097 BC would fall about the time that the Jews received their first king, a thing that in itself highly was displeasing to God. Did you just get that right there? So let's write this down. Are you ready, friends? Yeah. You ready for the timeline? Yeah. 1097. Saul becomes king. You got that? Yeah. 490 years later is 607. 607 BC. Guess who became king in 607? Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was carried away captive by who? Nebuchadnezzar. Are you all still with me, friends? 607 was also the time that, the, in the first time in history, that a Gentile king chose a Gentile king chose the king for uh, for uh, uh, Judah. And that was actually the Egyptian king. And then in 607, he then goes into captivity. So 607, why would the 2450 start in 607? Because the land starts to rest. Are you with me, friends? So because the land is resting, you can now start that prophecy. So from 607 to 1844, you have 2,450 years. Did you just get that right there, friends? Did everyone get that? Now, here's what even gets even more. Now, so we're done pretty much with that one. But let me make it more interesting for you. Is that all right? So here we have Saul, the first king of Israel, causes the captivity of the first king of Judah. Right? Jehoiakim was the first king. Jehoiachin was the second king. And Zedekiah was the third king. I'm going to bring something out about that in just a minute here. Now, before 607, 70 years before that, was 677 when Manasseh went into captivity, which starts the 2520. So you have 70 years, and then for 607, down here to the decree of Cyrus, which was in 537 or 536, that's 70 years of captivity. Are you with me, friends? So you have a 490, a 70, a 70, and then guess what else you have right there? In 457, you have what? In 457, you have a 2300, but you also have another 70 right here, or 490. From 457 to 34 AD. Are you all getting this? Are you seeing some divine math right here? 490, 70, 70, 490. A 2520 here, a 2450 there, a 2300 there. Are you all still with me, friends? Then it gets even more interesting, because of course, later on right here, you have... 508, the daily taken away, 538, from 538 to 1798 is a 1260, right? And this is kind of, this is of course a little bit condensed right here. And then from 538 to where? 723 is a second 1260. So you have all these different prophecies that are very interesting right here. But if you look at this, once again, so the captivity of the king or the first king leads to the downfall of the first king here. Now, you know what's even more interesting about this pattern? Is that you have one king, Saul, two king, David, third king, Solomon, and then the nation divides. Are you all with me, friends? So you have a one, two, three combination. Then you come down to when Jehoiakim goes into captivity, and you have Jehoiakim, the first king, Jehoiachin, the second king, and Zedekiah, the third king, and Judah falls. So you have another one, two, three combination. Are you seeing this so far? Yeah. Then you come down here to 457, and prior to this, you have 537 or 6. Cyrus is the first king. Darius is the second king. And Artaxerxes is the third king to begin to restore and build Jerusalem. So it takes three kings to destroy, three kings to build up. Three kings to scatter, and three angels to gather. 7098 is the first angel. 1842 is the second angel. And 1843 is the third angel. Five minutes, thank you. Which would then enter into the gathering time. Are you all with me, brothers and sisters? So when we look at these divine patterns, these divine fingerprints, 
We have the Jubilee of Jubilees, which the Millerites believed when Christ would come to redeem the land. And what they had a mistake on, and we're going to have to wrap up right here, the mistake was not in the mathematical reckoning. No. You want to know why this mistake was not in the mathematical reckoning? Because Gabriel was sent by the wonderful numberer. They had the events with the misunderstanding. But the dates are divinely endorsed. And in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter is established, brothers and sisters. So as we prepare to wrap up right now, and as we prepare to close because of time's sake, was that, was that uh, did everyone understand that right there? So we have three witnesses for 1798, and we have three witnesses for 1844. Amen? So in conclusion, the question was, what is the 2450? That's what it was. <laughs> Friends, as we wrap up, I don't know about you, but I want to partake of the final events to which these prophecies are pointing. I want to have my sins blotted out in the sanctuary. I want to be gathered and keep the covenant. And I want to be part of the great family reunion where we enter into the inherited land. Amen? Amen. So as we close out on this seventh day Sabbath, and as we are now entering into the first day of the week, how appropriate that we can close in prayer and say, Lord, help us to be ready for that ultimate Sabbath and that jubilee of jubilees when we can go home. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your divine timing. Thank you for helping us to be able to conclude these talks. Amen. We thank you for pouring out your spirit and giving us understanding. Thank you for so much for all of these wonderful truths that simply confirm that these events will take place and that these prophecies are correct and that we truly are your people. As we close out the Sabbath, we thank you for a new week. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that has been here with us throughout this day. And I pray that you please seal within our hearts the convictions of your Spirit, that you would forgive us of our sins, and that you would please help us, we pray, to abide in Christ. And Father, ultimately, as your Son Jesus, our Savior, is finishing the work of atonement, may we enter into his final Sabbath rest, May we be that host or that people that are gathered into the covenant-keeping, denominated people of God. And may we be a partaker of not only the cleansing of the sanctuary, but also the great jubilee when Jesus shall come and reunite us to our loved ones. And then we can go home. Bless us is my prayer. Thank you for this camp meeting. And please be with those all here, not only under the sound of my voice, but those who are watching. And bless them, and may your face be your face turn in shining love upon them. Grant us your blessing and peace as we part. And we thank you for the Sabbath day which has ended. Seal this experience in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen.